All of this is made possible through co-sponsorship by, and I'm sorry I have to read my list so I don't forget anyone, co-sponsorship by the Department of Anthropology, Department of History, Department of Sociology, the School of Criminal Justice, Department of Art, Art History and Design, the Museum Studies Program, Matrix, the College of Arts and Letters, and the College of Social Science. And we thank all of those units for their support. On behalf of the Department of Anthropology, I would like to also acknowledge MSU's new Alumni and Friends of Archaeology Expendable Fund, which provided the foundational funding for all of the events this week. This is a new fund, and we chose cultural heritage as our theme for this initial Alumni and Friends event to highlight our, our emerging excellence in this area. Dr. Yates was then the obvious choice for a visiting scholar. After graduating with a bachelor's degree in archaeology from Boston University, Donna went on to the University of Cambridge, where she earned a master's degree in archaeological heritage and museums, and completed her PhD in archaeology, looking at the legal, social, and professional construction of archaeology and heritage in the rapidly changing social and political climate of modern Bolivia. Her work is well published and widely available online. She has conducted trafficking or archaeology field work in Belize, Guatemala, Ecuador, Greece, Mexico, Nepal, and Bolivia. She is currently a lecturer in antiquities trafficking and art crime at the University of Glasgow's Scottish Center for Crime and Justice, Justice Research, and a founding member of the Trafficking Culture International Research Consortium. Her talk tonight is entitled Culture Crime Investigating Global Antiquities Trafficking. Please welcome Dr. Donna Yates. Well, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? The, I think I just turned the mic on. Thumbs up. OK, well, thank you so much for that introduction, Jody. And thank you so much for the warm welcome that you all have offered me. I've really enjoyed having a chance to actually talk to you guys and see the work that you're doing. And it's, it's been really, really quite interesting and, and very fun. Um, I, I'm glad that you brought up heritage studies in this, because I think at the core of this talk, um, I, I, I'm trying to demonstrate how um, heritage studies is really a hybrid discipline. It draws on a lot of different areas and different fields and different methodologies to answer really big and important questions, uh, not just about the past, about identity, about politics, and about really practical real world things. And I obviously, I'm an archaeologist, but I am employed by a criminology department. So I sit in a criminology department um, because I've been supported to do this hybrid research. Um, and that's really what the Trafficking Culture Project is. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Um, this talk is, is geared towards just, just giving you guys a taste of the kind of research we do by combining archaeology and heritage questions with criminological and sociological methodologies and practices. I'm going to, I should just go forward there. I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the issue of antiquities trafficking, just the basic background. I'm going to tell you how we're using criminology to understand this type of antiquity smuggling, which seems absolutely obvious, but really up to the point of our project has been housed almost entirely within archaeology. Um, criminology hasn't been involved at all. I'm going to give you two hopefully exciting case studies of our work, and I'm going to get to those really quick because they're fun. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the results of this research show, give us an indication about where we can focus our, our actual real world on the ground efforts to protect cultural heritage from destruction, theft, smuggling, and to really just preserve the past for the future, to use a, a well-worn phrase. So really, at a basic level, what I study is the trafficking of cultural objects, the theft of cultural objects from archaeological sites, museums, heritage buildings, temples, churches, and how they move through space and time um, to the illicit market. And the, the, the real issue here is one of these grand areas of study within heritage studies. And that's the disconnect between the idea that heritage is something owned by everybody or is unownable, that it's shared collectively, 
and the idea that heritage can be privately owned and held by individual people. And there's, there's quite a lot of different stops along this spectrum. But ultimately, this creates a conflict, this idea that heritage objects can be private property or that they are part of something bigger that is owned by everybody. And ultimately, there is a global demand for cultural property. There is a global demand for antiquities. There's a global demand for artifacts and the physical bits of cultural heritage. And as we consider this disconnect, as we consider these different views of cultural heritage and private property and ownership, we start getting at um, places where this has been criminalized, where people have uh, attempted to preserve these different things um, and to prevent certain types of private interaction with them. And that's, that's all, all sorts of background stuff. I could talk about that all day, but that's not really what we're gonna do here. But it is important to remember that the antiquities market, the, 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 the structure within one buys and sells ancient objects has its foundations in the colonial era and the market is ultimately Western. It works on a Western mar model, and it, it emerges out of a sense of European exceptionalism, this idea that uh, a European idea of ownership and private property can be placed on other people. And this is just a couple of pictures of various leading things from the colonial era, but I have to show you this because this is amazing. This is, this is the Summer Palace in China, which was very famously looted by British soldiers led by Lord Elgin, Jr. So this is, this is the son of Lord Elgin who famously took the Parthenon marbles. His son was involved in the looting of the Summer Palace and it was eventually destroyed and the artifacts from this are scattered all around and, and some of them are slowly moving back to China. One of the things they did is they brought back a dog, I think this is a Shih Tzu, it's like the first Shih Tzu that came to, China, to the UK, as a present for Queen Victoria. And the dog's name was Ludi. They named the dog Ludi. This is, this is such an accepted um, aspect of the colonial era. And this is the area where the antiquities market has its foundations. And interestingly enough, the term loot, the term we use to, to describe the taking of cultural objects is actually a Hindi word. It's the Hindi word loot, which means the same thing. So we actually took the word loot <laughs> from India. <laughs> And there's, there's horrible things here we have. This is in um, Nigeria. This is after a particularly violent suppression of certain things. A whole bunch of cultural objects left. This is an interesting collection of actual human heads. These are Maori tattooed heads. This is the fellow collecting them. Interesting stuff. And it, it's, a, it's a dark period in time. But this is, this is when the market for antiquities is formed, and this is the foundation of the antiquities market. And this is, this is what the market was developed for in many ways. And even today, the, the, the trade in antiquities is an exploitative system in a lot of ways. It takes heritage objects from the hands of the many and moves them to the hands of the few. That is the general goal of this market. Source countries, which is the term that we use to describe the, the, the places where antiquities come from, tend to be developing countries. Not always, but they tend to be poor. Market countries tend to be wealthy countries. Not always, but they tend to have more international power and clout. And the general flow of these objects is from uh, poor to rich, from, from countries that tend to define their ownership of cultural objects as being collective, as, as not being ownable by one person to countries that have a very different view of that. And this is ultimately a power imbalance. This fellow here, right here in Colombia, absolutely doesn't have the power on the world stage that this, this person right here with this controversial possibly looted antiquity has. Um, when, when it comes to the development of policies for protection, when it comes to lobbying policymakers to um, create ways to protect their heritage. And that is a, a place that we hope to fill. And before I go further, I wanna be very clear about something. Um, when it comes to antiquities, when it comes to the antiquities market, there is no black market for antiquities. There's no white, clean market for antiquities. There is one market for antiquities. And because of the structure of this market, it is nearly impossible to distinguish between fully legal, licit antiquities 
and illicit antiquities, antiquities that are illegal in some way. This is a gray market, and that's how we have to treat it. So moving forward, um, I know not everybody in this room are archaeologists. Um, I know not everybody in this room are criminologists. Um, but in, in, in framing this idea of antiquities trafficking as a potential problem, it's helpful to kind of think of what are the harms here. Is there a harm in this market? Is, is there something, a, a societal negative to the continuation of the illicit antiquities market? And I think so, because I think that it is destructive physically and it's destructive socially. So just thinking about theft of an antiquity from a couple of different places. So an ancient site, an archaeological site. Any archaeologist in this room will tell you that the looting of antiquities destroys archaeological context. It destroys where an artifact is and what it relates to. If a non-professional takes an artifact out of the ground and moves it in various ways onto the international market, all of the contextual information is lost. And context is how archaeologists reconstruct the past. It is our bread and butter. And even if you return this cultural object, even if we are able to recover it and send it back to its country of origin, the context is already lost. The past is already lost. This ridiculous looted landscape is an archaeological site, and that's basically gone. There's very little we're going to get out of that. So it's extremely destructive physically. That's destructive to the, the, the science of archaeology and our collective understanding of the past. Well, think about a theft of a, a, a cultural item from a museum, from a major international museum or from a small local site museum that serves a community. Um, museums are, are places of public trust. They're institutions that we as the public um, depend upon to preserve and present our culture and heritage. Theft from these kinds of institutions breeds social insecurity. It's a violation of that public trust. And in many situations, because of underfunding, damage and theft of cultural objects from these museums don't result in any adequate replacement. So you've lost kind of this community center and this community ideal. From a sacred site, and this is where I'm working a lot lately, at sacred sites. So this may be a very ancient temple that's still in use. This may be a very old church that's still in use that has cultural objects within it. And uh, like, like this Buddha here that has lost its head um, almost certainly to the international antiquities markets. Buddha heads are very big. Um, this is a loss of a living God. This is a, a real tangible loss to people. And the loss of these gods and, and deities and these important spiritual centers aids, if you want to call it that, into the breakdown of community cohesion. It, it, it causes communities to fall apart. And it challenges fundamental components of, of community, group, and individual identity. Um, this, is, this is suddenly the god is on sale on eBay. It's, it's really quite challenging to long-standing held community beliefs. So that's, that's very socially harmful. And away from all of this the harm to science, harm to social cohesion, this is not a victimless crime. It is a very physical crime at times. So just a few recent headlines, Chinese tomb raiders suffocate, uh, Egyptian man dies while digging for artifacts in Alexandria. This says autopsy reveals that a wakero, so a, a tomb robber, was murdered. Um, watchman killed in attempted heist at archaeological site. That's also in Egypt. So this, this can turn into violent crime. And ultimately, people die so that culture be, can be concentrated in the hands of the very few. They die to feed this illicit market. And basically, really ugly things happen so rich people can privately own pretty things. And this is where I start getting worried. This is where I enter. This is, this is kind of the core of my motivation for getting involved in this. Because th this isn't a reason for somebody to get hurt or die. Um, it can be quite painful. But just remember that this is not a victimless crime. There are all sorts of other crimes around the core crime of antiquities trafficking to worry about. In the media in general, um, I imagine that if you all thought of antiquities trafficking right now, you guys are probably thinking of Iraq and Syria. You're thinking about Palmyra, you're thinking of pictures you've seen. And in the media generally, antiquities trafficking is very problematically associated 
almost exclusively with either conflict or disaster. So it, it feels like potentially that antiquities are only looted when there's, you know, ISIS doing something or other and there's terrorism and there's a conflict or when there's an earthquake in Nepal, everybody storms the temples and takes everything. Um, and that's, that's how it is portrayed in the media. But that is very much not true. We think it's wrong to associate this with only conflict and disaster because the looting of antiquities we know is a long-standing global problem. Um, and this constant association of the looting and trafficking of antiquities only with disaster, only with conflict, really we feel evidences a fundamental misunderstanding of this criminal enterprise, its motivations, its causes, and potentially its its solutions, the, our ability to regulate it. If we're only looking at it in certain particular contexts, we're not necessarily making effective policy. And the goal on my project, on, on our project, is to try to get this right, to, to try to understand what's really going on, and very particularly to try to understand the trafficking phase of this, the actual movement of these objects from source to market, this mysterious middle bit, and try to see about where we can intervene. So very quickly, the Trafficking Culture Project, and that should actually say uh, International Research Consortium, because we are now an international research consortium. Um, the Trafficking Culture Project started in 2012, um, thanks very much to uh, a large European Research Council grant, as well as funding from the Fulbright and from the, the Leverhulme. And our core goal in this project was to combine archaeology, art history, law, and criminology to really tackle, again, this middle bit of, um, of the, the trafficking chain in a way that hadn't been approached before. Because really, this, this kind of criminological and also sociological uh, framing of this issue had just had never been explored. Um, we're now, like I said, an international research consortium based at um, several universities. And what we do is a lot of field work um, various types of research. We do policy advice and consultation, a lot of teaching, and very importantly, public awareness. Um, but it, I, I want to emphasize that we're not an NGO or a lobbying group, and we don't give legal advice. So any of you are about to raise your hand and say, what should I do with my dodgy antiquity? I'm not going to answer that question. But our goal is to do really solid, um, empirical, foundational, academic research that has a clear, practical purpose. We're striving to be immediately relevant um, when it comes to real-world problems related to the looting and trafficking and sale of antiquities. Um, and we engage in these, these, these kinds of foundational studies really to provide lawmakers and stakeholders and various heritage professionals with the information they need to craft really good policy. And to do this, our work is necessarily multidisciplinary, like I said. And today, what I really want to concentrate on is how we, and particularly me, have been using criminological ideas to, to, to shape and mold and um, reform our research. And as an archaeologist, this has been an interesting revelation to me over the past four years, starting to incorporate um, various types of criminological thinking, because there's a wealth of knowledge within criminology that just, again, has not been applied to this problem. And within heritage studies, that's absolutely fine. That's encouraged. It's so exciting. So criminology, for those who don't know, is um, very basically put uh, this quote, um, the looking at the, the consequences and the prevention of criminal behavior and so on and so forth. But for us, it really is this wealth of research focused on um, understanding the connection between certain behaviors and regulation. So if we're trying to think of ways to actually prevent antiquities from being looted, trafficked, and sold, there's this wealth of information from within criminology of how you can connect the behaviors with this type of regulation of various kinds. And that's really exciting. And in criminology, there's all sorts of work that's been done in a number of areas. And these are, these are I suggest going to our website, looking at some of our papers, because these, these are some of the areas we've explored when it comes to antiquities. So thinking about transnational organized crime, white collar crime, uh, all sorts of things like that, market reduction. There's, there's a wealth of things to apply 
to this, this um, question, I basically think of a new PhD for somebody every single day. But the main thing, the main thing that um, I think has really shifted with our research, it's shifted with my own research since moving into a criminology department and, and thinking about things as that way, is that we're starting to ask this question, what information can we gather about cultural property, about antiquities trafficking, if we focus our attention on the actual crimes and not necessarily the object? The object clearly matters, but if our focus isn't necessarily uh, affecting the return of this object, if our focus is understanding the structure through which the object moved, we can get some really important and valuable information out of that. We can start to understand the structures of these criminal networks. We can start to look at the motivation of the criminals and other actors along the smuggling chain and think about where we can intervene there. And most importantly, which is what I'm gonna talk about a little bit today, is we can look for weak links in that chain, places where our interventions would be truly effective. I think that's pretty exciting. And based on this type of research, like I said, we can disrupt these crimes, we, and then we can evaluate our attempts at destruction. We can see if it's actually working. And this is different than repatriation, but it helps repatriation. So now, two case studies. This is where it's going to get a bit interesting. Hopefully, the Indian one's more interesting than the Cambodia one, but the Cambodia one's pretty good. And I want to talk just a little bit about what we can learn by applying criminological thinking to this problem. And I emphasize again for any criminal justice people in the room that I am not the criminologist on the project. I, I have a criminologist with me for things. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you how my own thinking has been modified and, and the different type of work that we can do by incorporating these different methodologies into heritage research. So we're going to talk about Cambodia first. And I'll say that this, this is directly the work of my trafficking culture colleagues, Simon McKenzie and Tess Davis. And um, the papers related to this Cambodia research and basically everything we've ever published ever are all available for free right here on our website. Have a look at it. And um, this comes out of over 10 years of work uh, done by Tess Davis in Cambodia on this topic and a summer of very targeted criminological research looking specifically at antiquity trafficking networks and conducting a whole bunch of interviews. And that's, that's where Simon the Criminologist comes in. Um, they talked to some absolutely terrifying people and um, got a lot of interesting results. So um, those of you familiar with Cambodia, those of you who are archaeologists, you may have seen in the news over the past few years a whole bunch of really high quality statues um, have been being returned from American museums and auction houses to Cambodia. I think the last one went back only a few months ago, but they're, they're trickling back. And these particular statues all come from, they're, they're from the 10th century. They're um, from the site of Kokher, and specifically they're from one sanctuary called Prasat Chen. And they depict the battle between Bhima and Durodana with all these attendants kneeling. And what you would do is, this is a reconstruction of what it looked like before it was looted. You would actually enter this temple and be almost at the same level. And you'd walk around this battle, this epic battle going on. Very cool stuff. Unfortunately, that was all looted, so you don't get to do that anymore. But potentially, you will one day. Um, and there's been a lot of work, also uh, Tess has worked on this, on the repatriation of these objects. But our question is not necessarily how to get these objects back. It's how did they get out in the first place? And that is exactly what uh, Tess and Simon went off to do. So they started asking the right questions to kind of reveal this information. And they're really basic questions. How were they too looted? Where were they trafficked? Who facilitated the smuggling and sale? Why did they do it? And what can be done to prevent this? And each one of these particular questions could spin off 100 new projects. But very quickly, how are they looted? Well, the looting of these statues, in particular in Cambodia, is related to the extended conflict in the country. So looting really kicked off in the 1970s and was much abated by 1998. It still continues in Cambodia, but that was just the free-for-all. 
uh, during this time, various armed factions engaged in forced looting. Um, some of this came from orders of former Khmer Rouge generals. Um, heavy machinery was used at times. Secrecy was unneeded. And basically, there was simply no law and order protection. Um, in the wake of the conflict, in the post-conflict, there just weren't um, high-level heritage protection structures. And people had few economic options, so they kind of moved into this. So trafficking networks. Simon and Tess actually reconstructed two trafficking networks. I'm just going to show you one. But they kind of show how these items moved into the market. And, and very quickly, um, what ended up happening for most of these statues, including the ones you saw and other antiquities coming from Cambodia, is that they'd be looted from sites in various places, Koker and Kurev, the Minas and Kur, um, by locals. The people who were actually looting the statues lived nearby. And they were either forced or had few other economic options. So they would loot these statues and pass them on to regional brokers. And these regional brokers would be collecting statues and other objects from the general periphery and eventually sending shipments up to Sisyphon. In Sisyphon, um, the, these objects coming from different locations um, would be collected by what we would traditionally consider to be a group of organized criminals. Um, they are difficult people um, who engage in a series of other organized crimes. They, they engage in a whole bunch of other different types of trafficking, transborder trafficking in wildlife, in humans. They do a lot of human trafficking. And they also engaged in antiquities trafficking. And for the most part, it was one group of people working in Sisyphon until one of them like tried to break out and cut out the others in the market, and bad things happened to them. So in Sisyphon, um, it would enter these organized criminal networks, and they had the particular type of organization that they were able to move these things across the border. Uh, and that means border corruption. They had the connections for border corruption to move the, the items from Sisyphon to Rani Prefet. Um, and uh, right around there, they'd be met by a Thai intermediary. And then the Thai intermediary would eventually move these objects to Bangkok where they were purchased by a white Western dealer who then had the ability to directly move these objects to the international market. This is an individual that was moving objects from that point directly to places like Sotheby's. So this is an important character. So that's, that's the structure of the network. That's one of the networks. So that's interesting stuff. There's a lot of things to think about there if you're trying to think about points of intervention. Which, of course, we were. So thinking about who uh, facilitated the smuggling of sales, exactly who I told you, the regional brokers, the organized criminals, this receiver on the Thai side of the border, this white Western internationally known dealer in Bangkok. And number five, the one we haven't talked about, are the museums and collectors who purchased these things. The museums and collectors who justified their actions in a variety of interesting ways and didn't ask questions about where the objects came from. And that right there is a, a, one of the points of our particular research, is how these museums and collectors justified decisions to engage in illicit markets that may have been questionable, how they justified doing that. Look on our website, we have that. And a, a really interesting point of um, uh, facilitation that's recently come out is, as it turns out, uh, Lieutenant General Pong Pan Chayafan, who is now the ex-head um, of uh, Thailand's, uh, basically their secret police, as it turns out, he was the key point of corruption. He's recently been arrested. All of this stuff came out of his property. And there was even more than that. So what are you going to do when the head of the secret police is the person who's corruptly facilitating this? So interesting times. But moving forward, why did they do it? Obviously, looters were paid some small amount of money, or they may have been forced. Regional brokers, again, they're talking about uh, getting an income in a time and place where income was scarce. Organized criminals, they're, they're looking for money, but they're also consolidating control over the tra trafficking networks in the region. They're trafficking other things, the trafficking antiquities. Thai brokers looking for money. 
But when we move to the Western dealers and the museum collectors, we start to get something else. Obviously, the Western dealer is looking for money, but we move into a point where our motivation is social prestige, where our motivation is cultural capital, where our motivation is displaying culturedness by dealing in and having fine art around you and displaying that for others. And that is an interesting, really cool place of research, that particular bit of motivation, where it moves outside of money, where it moves into this display of culture. So coming out of this, asking some real questions, what can be done to prevent this kind of trafficking? And what is the relevance of this beyond Cambodia? And I think that's really important. In other words, what results from this kind of work can be used to actually craft better policy? Well, coming out of this, um, Tess and Simon, uh, initially and then more of us later, have identified the idea of a Janus figure. So the Roman god Janus, who is, had two faces, could see into the past, could see into the future at the same time. Well, we're identifying these figures who we, who we think act like Janus. They have two faces. One face is this dark, illicit, totally illicit, organized crime horrible smugglers on the Thai border side of the crime, and the other side faces the high-end auction houses and museums. And these are individuals who operate in both worlds. And these are individuals that are the most difficult to replace in these smuggling networks, because not everybody can walk into that role. That guy on the border in Thailand is not emailing Sotheby's. That's not going to happen. And vice versa, I, maybe as, as some sort of high-end dealer, don't really have a place on the Thai border with a bunch of smugglers. So these guys are vital to the functioning of this criminal network. So we need to focus a lot of research on them. This is a choke point. If we can figure out how to disrupt these people, we start to disrupt the networks. Um, we need to look at transit ports. So Thailand's really quite interesting because a lot of regional antiquities seem to flow through there. Why is that? because they have very poor regulation and control. Thus, anything that comes through Thailand, we may want to start considering to be suspect. We need to treat these as suspicious. If you've got a Cambodian object with Thai papers, maybe something's wrong. If you've got an Indian object with Thai papers, that's even farther away. Something's going on here. And we need to collectively push these governments to change their policy when it comes to import and export. And that's really effectively being done in certain places. Um, corruption is a factor, obviously, but what's a tangible thing that we can do to deal with uh, corruption when it comes to antiquities? Well, we need to talk about in including a focus on cultural property and heritage in international and national anti-corruption efforts. We need to introduce this as a potential form of corruption and a place for investigation. And again, that's, that's starting to be introduced in a lot of places, and that's really why this, this fellow went down. He was doing a lot of interesting things. Um, and the other thing we need to do is look at parallel crimes because those people we can see who engage in certain areas of antiquities trafficking also engage in other crimes. Um, they might be wildlife smugglers and so on. And we can see how our interventions into those crimes potentially help prevent antiquities trafficking of various kinds. Um, we, can, we can double up on our policing efforts and do both at the same time potentially or see where that's going wrong and not make the same mistakes areas of research. And this is a big one that I'll get to in the next one, but we really need to document any antiquities that we possibly can. I didn't get to the story, but the, the Prasat Chen statues, one of the reasons they have been successfully tied to Prasat Chen, even though they were looted and unrecorded, is the looters left the feet. So you can slot the statue right back on it. You know exactly where those statues came from. But if you didn't have those feet there, we would never know they necessarily came from Prasat Chen. There's no photograph taken of them. So documenting everything you can possibly document. But again, I'll get to that later. So Cambodia, that's, that's the work we've been doing in Cambodia. But I want to move to India, because this, this is a really interesting ongoing case. This, this case continues to get bigger and darker, and there's something new in the papers every week, and somebody new has been arrested, and the network's unfolding. So I'm, I'm just going to show you one tiny little corner of this network, because there's more coming out of it. So we're going to talk about this Shiva Nataraja that was once in the National Gallery of Australia. So let me introduce you to Shubash Kapoor here. 
So Shubhash Kapoor, I believe, was a naturalized U.S. citizen. He's originally from India. But um, he was the owner of the Art of the Past Gallery in New York City. And this is a gallery that sold uh, Asian antiquities of various kinds. You're just looking to see what's in that picture, that looks like uh, Gantara Buddha, probably from the Pakistan, Afghanistan area, a lot of Indian stuff. And he was trading in antiquities since 1974. Um, considered to be completely upstanding, this is where the highest end of people bought their Indian antiquities. But I'm going to ask you as you watch this, is Shubhash Kapoor one of these Janus figures that we're supposed to be looking out for and studying? So let me tell you a story. So 2005, Shubhash Kapoor travels to India. He travels to the state of Tamil Nadu, and he meets with an art dealer named Sanjeevi Ashokan. And when I say local art dealer, we're talking low level. This is, this is, not, this is not your uh, New York City gallery art dealer. This, this is a local fixer. And Shubhash Kapoor specifically orders Chola bronzes these beautiful, beautiful bronze statues, these this gorgeous things, to be stolen because he wants to buy them. And these statues these are quite ancient, but they are in living temples. These are objects of active worship. And Ashokan, who wants to get in on this money that Shubhash Kapoor is offering, um, has a think about it and decides specifically to target remote temples and poor communities because they are very unlikely to have security. And one of those temples was this temple, the Sri Paranthan Village Temple in Tamil Nadu. And luckily for Ashokan, it had eight of these Chola bronze in them, and it was closed due to some sort of infestation of scorpions or something. So people weren't using the temple. It was locked. It was filled with scorpions or spiders or something terrible. But it was still the house of the gods, and the gods were still inside of it, and people were still using it in that respect. This is still an important place in the community. This is where the gods live. Well, Shokin hired local thieves to rob it in January of 2006. And they did. And over the course of three robberies, they stole all eight statues that were in there. And these are the eight statues in, in earlier photographs that we happen to have. And it took three robberies because some of these are rather big. Um, and one of the, the biggest one is this Shiva Nataraja, which is about this tall. It's about this tall on me. Um, and it is Shiva as the cosmic dancer who is dancing the end of the universe, which is horribly evocative, absolutely lovely, and huge on the international art market. So what did Ashokan do? First of all, he paid off the thieves. He gave them about $6,000. That's a lot for those guys. And how did he traffic these items? He bought a whole bunch of new Chola-style statues, recently made. He mixed them all together in a couple of different shipments, got a permit to export modern statues, and sent them off, knowing that if any customs agents opens it up, they're expecting to see statues, modern statues. They might notice not notice these old ones in there, because they're not specialists, are they? Turns out they didn't even open the boxes ever, so it didn't even matter. And Shubhash Kapoor paid him about 30,000 US dollars for the shipment. That's quite a, a step up from $6,000 to $30,000. So moving forward, how did the statues travel? Well, they started in Tamil Nadu, and they were sent to Hong Kong. Is Hong Kong one of these transit ports? We think so. In Hong Kong, they pick up papers. So when they leave Hong Kong, there, there is some evidence that they've been in Hong Kong. They, they have a little bit more of a pedigree. And where does he send them? He sends them to London, oddly enough. But they're not going to stay in London. They just travel to London, where they pick up a bit more in the way of papers. And then eventually, they're sent to New York, which is considered, at least in, in this particular chain, the, the more difficult place for it to get into. And eventually, they end up in Australia. So this is, this is how these things traveled in the course of about a year, a, a little bit less than a year. And looking at the prices, the looters got $6,000 about to split between four people. The middleman got $30,000. Sounds really good. Shubhash Kapoor sold the one Shiva Nataraja statue to the National Gallery of Australia for $5,600,000 for his total, what, $36,000 investment. This is, this is the, the increase. 
And ultimately, this, this shows kind of the power and balance of the chain. The leaders at the bottom took the most risk. They are the most likely to get arrested, and they got the least return on this. So what happened with this Shiva trafficking the sale? Um, Shubhash Kapoor let certain people who were in the market for this kind of stuff know that they were there and available. He contacted the National Gallery of Australia, and the chairman and the director of the National Gallery of Australia visited Kapoor's gallery in New York to see this Nataraja that was for sale. Um, Shubhash Kapoor provided them with documents that showed that the Nataraja was out of India before 1970. Of course, these documents were forged. And that gets us to this really interesting little place that, that I think is very important for us to think about, is what did the museum do in this situation? So there's uh, an idea within uh, the study of white collar crime, particularly in tax fraud, about creative compliance. And this is complying or following the letter of the law while still breaking the spirit of the law. This is, this is where tax loopholes come in. This is, think of it as that kind of stuff where you do everything by the book and you do things by the book in such a way where you get to do exactly what you want to do and you're doing the thing that they're trying to prevent you from doing. And then there's an idea of due diligence, where you very genuinely do an adequate amount of research to make sure the item you have isn't stolen, isn't illicit in some way, um, you're following ethical guidelines, you're doing exactly what you want to do. So I want you guys to think about, was the National Gallery of Australia due diligent in their research about buying this lovely Shiva, or were they creatively complying, doing the least amount they could possibly do to try to do the thing they exactly wanted to do. So think of a few things that happened when they were considering buying the Shiva. The director of the museum, who I shall say um, has recently retired, um, <laughs> the director set up an investigating committee to, to look into the provenance and background of this object. That sounds really good. They're really going to do this, right? Well, it never met. They were told by Shubash Kapoor that the pieces were bought in 1970 from Delhi's Fine Art Museum. And don't get confused, he wasn't saying that was a museum, he was saying that was an antiquity shop in a certain part of Delhi. But that still sounds like something you can check, right? You know, maybe you should call them, look into this, look for some sale records. Well, they didn't try to contact them, which is good because it never existed. And they were told by Shubash Kapoor that the Shiva was um, bought in the United States, so he's not the one who ever bought it into the United States, from the widow of a Sudanese diplomat. And he gave them the woman's name, and he gave them her address. So you think, well, obviously you're going to call this lady up, right? They didn't call her. But what they did is they looked up her home on Google Maps, and when they saw it was a real house, they decided that was enough. Just as a small aside, no judgment or anything, but this is the house that the National Gallery of Australia saw on Google Maps. And I should say I got this off the Chasing Aphrodite blog, but I'm going to thank them again at the end. This is, this is not where you'd expect a woman who owns a $5.6 million statue to live. But seeing that, the National Gallery of Australia thought, we're not going to call this lady, don't want to disturb her, you know. So the big thing they didn't do is they did not contact the Tamil Nadu State Police, who has a whole investigative wing dedicated to stolen idol cases. They actually have police officers who are trained and dedicated to preventing antiquities trafficking. They didn't call those guys up. Those guys speak English. <laughs> And even although the National Gallery of Australia admitted that they did look at the Stolen Idol Wings website in 2009 where they post pictures of stolen statues and the Shiva Nataraja was on there at that time, they thought it was a different Shiva Nataraja, so they didn't call them then either. So is just enough enough or is it not enough? Um, Unclear. So just to tell you what happened to the to Shiva afterwards, um, and again, I emphasize this case goes on and on and on in all directions. 
But um, the theft was actually discovered in 2008, so we're talking about two years after it happened. And what, what happened is um, India, Indian heritage officials came to the village um, because they had records that these statues were there to install a protective screen to prevent the statues from being stolen. They opened the place up and the statues had been stolen already. They were already gone, which... Um, caused an immediate police investigation. And the thieves were caught really quite quickly after the discovery of the theft. They found those guys. And those thieves, of course, rolled on Ashokan, who was arrested in 2009, who, of course, rolled on Shubash Kapoor. And that triggered all sorts of investigations into the United, in the United States, where he had his main business. And Kapoor was arrested in Germany in 2011 and returned to India. He is now on trial in India, still it hasn't actually really started, but it constantly almost starts. We'll see when this starts. But, uh, <laughs> but I should say that, again, every single day, there are new arrests in India of people associated with Kapoor that go off in different directions. There was something like four of them like three days ago. I'm not, it, it's, it's, it's amazing how much, how, how far this goes and how complicated this network was. In the United States, Kapoor's New York warehouse was raided in 2012, and $20 million worth of stolen goods were seized at that time. And in that warehouse were three Chola bronzes that were actually on Interpol's public database of stolen art. So these are things he absolutely knew were stolen. Obviously he did, but you, you, you can't argue that he was due diligent in any way. And um, they did seize about $100 million in assets from Kapoor in a variety of ways. And uh, a number of his business associates um, very wisely chose to take pleas and, um, <laughs> and explain various aspects of this network. And a lot of the, the um, information I'm giving you now is coming from, from what these people revealed that happened in the United States. What's really interesting about the Shiva is we have photographs of it. So unlike other looted antiquities, there aren't photographs. So we actually have this, this photograph here that was um, taken um, by the French Institute of Pondicherry in 1994, which means we placed this object in India at a time when it was illegal for it to leave India. We have it here in the National Gallery of Australia. It's the same object. What we have in the center is this really great thing. This is the wonderful thing about smartphones and social media, is this is a picture of the statue that was taken off of Shubash Kapoor's phone. Because after it was stolen, those folks sent a picture of him to show him the stuff. Do you want this thing? Yes, I do. Um, <laughs> so we have this perfect line of stuff. And this documentation, this initial documentation is, is vital. This is very helpful, but this is what's vital. And, and, and this kind of, this tiny little bit of documentation is what can take down a smuggling ring. Because you can get a conviction off of that. You can get a return of the object off of that because you absolutely know where it was at that point in time. Who bought from Kapoor? Well, it's pretty shameful. Um, <laughs> when, when we say how high the level this dealer was, he was a very high level dealer. And that is causing a lot of returns. Um, some of them voluntary, some of them semi-involuntary. There's a lot of soul searching going on, a lot of museums in the world, and a lot of provenance research going on. You have the, the Shiva actually went back to India. It's great. Um, uh, then Prime Minister of uh, Australia brought it back and left with a uranium deal with India. They've got some uh, antiquities diplomacy there. And, and a lot of people doing the right thing. So, so here and here from different museums who are voluntarily saying, we bought this from Shubash Kapoor. We don't know if it's dodgy, but we don't want to have it. So it's interesting stuff. And there's been really, really good reporting of this and research done by particularly the India Pride Project. I totally visit their website. They're great. Vijay Kumar Anurag Saxena, who um, have done the underlying research for the return of these objects, and um, journalists Michaela Bullen and Jason Felch, who've done a lot of the exposure of this stuff. And they're both still at it, exposing more of this. Very good stuff. So, Again, I want to ask the same questions. What can be done to prevent this? Why is it relevant? How can we use this to craft better policy? Well, again, we've got this Janus figure. 
we've got another model of a Janus speaker, and we can study how he operated and perhaps come up with some sort of model to identify these Janus figures who are operating at this high level that everybody thinks are wonderful and fine, but actually are the linchpin in these, these um, networks. We've got another transit port. We've got Hong Kong. We can look into treating these ports as suspicious and try to move them towards um, better practice. This has actually been going on in the Geneva Freeport. They've cleaned up their act. We've got creative compliance, and we've got creative compliance on the part of dealers, collectors, and museums on our side. Some of these are our people, I say, as a heritage professional. And we need to think about how these rules and regulations and, and codes of ethics can be creatively complied to, and we need to support researchers, um, embed them in the policy and um, uh, and ethical guidelines making frameworks so that they can help anticipate loopholes. Um, we need to start connecting these art objects, these, these pieces of fine art, to looting directly. We need to make sure people entering a museum know that they're looking at the product of smuggling, crime, and criminals. We need to change the minds of the public. Um, documentation, as I said before, and that moves us into some ideas. I'm almost done here. But one thing I think it's really important to think about is um, where we're placing the burden of preventing antiquities trafficking. And a lot of the burden is placed on source countries in the developing world. And police and customs in these countries are our absolute only line of defense. Because the moment an antiquity crosses a border, it is not going to come back almost certainly. It's expensive for these countries. Criminals know how to exploit the system. But we need to start thinking about ways to increase training and increase funding. If we consider this as a global problem that affects all of us, and that's certainly an argument that can be made, we, we can't just cut these people off and tell them to enforce their own laws and hope for the best. We need to start criminalizing the market, though, and not just the source. It is far easy to catch somebody and convict them and punish them in various ways at the source in the market because market actors are white collar actors. They're, they tend to be the kind of people who have lawyers. We need to make it socially unacceptable to collect antiquities that might be illicit. And certain, certain people are starting to use terms like blood antiquities to try to make it more like collecting ivory. We need to prosecute and sue criminal buyers and not just settle for the return of an artifact, because usually somebody who has a dodgy artifact can give it back and walk away. That's, that's not, not quite necessarily preventing the behavior. And we need to put a face on the loss. We need to have more public awareness in, in market countries about the destructive nature of this. Because demand causes supply, and the market is where we can intervene, and the market is where we do not intervene. We need to inventory everything. We need to document public heritage, because one casual smartphone photo can break up a whole smuggling network. We can think about ways of in, engaging communities to do their own documentation and uh, own their own archives of their own cultural heritage that can be used in case of theft. And we can start a public dialogue that kind of says, these objects have been documented, so they're now unsellable to prevent theft in the first place. And we need to think about alternative security beyond locks and alarms. We need to think about how people move through space and create certain types of protection in areas where you're never going to have an alarm because there isn't electricity. We need to borrow security strategies from other countries and from other types of valuable commodities. And this is really where um, ethnographic work and criminological work becomes important. And spoiler, this is the kind of stuff that I'm trying to do now. So <laughs> it's, it's what I care about. And, and I think through this kind of practical research, we can start to challenge the public sales of these stolen arts, even in situations where we know the damage has been done. We know we're not going to get archaeological context back. But if we continue to have these public dialogues and discussions, if we connect this market with the harms it causes, we can add a degree of buyer doubt to sales. And we can undermine the idea of a market for antiquities. And I think that might have a real effect. And that's it for me, guys. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions.
No questions. Oh, there's a question. <laughs> Why is that? Because in order to study uh, Indian, we need an appreciation of Indian culture, of the Indian culture in the United States and in Australia and other countries. I absolutely agree with you. Okay. So, it, it, isn't it important to create a legitimate pipeline for those objects to get here? And I have to, I, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, to apply the criminal law to this, it hasn't worked for drugs. It no. hasn't worked for this. No. Uh, and so now, you're not going to solve this by just saying, uh, get tough on these people. Get tough, no. It, it, it just doesn't work. It is the demand that has to be. Uh, exactly. Controlled. And it seems to me, if there was a system of getting these cultural things to the great museums, mm -hmm. as we agree should be done, that would be a way to attack. The and the glorious thing is there is a way to do that. And there's a, a very well-established, fully legal, everybody wins way to do that. And that is through partnership and exchange. And this is something that museums in places like India, Peru, um, very much like. So what they end up doing is they send uh, a large amount of their very high quality objects, sometimes their best ob objects, on a traveling tour or uh, to a specific museum for a period of time. They retain ownership of the objects. The museum somewhere else in the West displays them. Um, the source country ends up getting a bump in tourist revenue as you and I go see it and think, wouldn't that be lovely to have my holiday in Peru or India? And there's no legal problem. There's a partnership created. And, and that is basically what museums do. Now, oddly enough, that's what the National Gallery of Australia usually does. So, so the, the, the idea of getting the things to the museum is not a problem. That, that's totally taken care of. And you're absolutely right about further criminalization. And I should very much emphasize, I, I actually, I could go back, I have a whole bunch of slides about um, uh, talking about responsive regulation. And um, when it comes to the market, we really think that looking at kind of alternative compliance rewards for complying rather than harsh criminalization is where we'll, we'll actually see something. So changing hearts and minds in a variety of ways, rewarding doing positive things, rewarding, say, facilitating these private, um, or no, sorry, facilitating these um, museum exchanges, sponsoring museum exchanges, getting to put your name on museum exchanges and so on is, is the way forward. Mm -hmm. uh, it strikes me that one wants here to enforce the criminal law in the United States mm -hmm. where there should be some question of India, how much are you protecting this object? Yeah. You can't just sit back and not visit these temples for two years and then say, uh-oh, it ended up in the United States. We want the United States to uh, prosecute. But because of a failure in one spot, does that mean that they deserve to have their laws violated? No. no. <laughs> we should We, we should encourage and we should help facilitate it. We should help train. We should help build these pathways towards this better protection, I think at least. How they want to portray themselves. How they portray themselves. So I think you also get variety mm -hmm. on the cheap when it comes to museums. So you have a museum audience, say here, that will maybe go once or twice to see a collection of Indian objects that are on display, and then in about three, four months' time, they can see a collection of Peruvian objects that come, and so on. So the 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 museum going crowd here gets variety. Um, that doesn't necessarily satisfy the private collector who wants to own the things privately and not necessarily share this with the public, but it solves this idea of intercultural exchange, 
again, without necessarily giving anything to the, <laughs> the, the collector side of things. So, yeah. Yes. And so there are many cultures and circumstances in which imaging is fed to And I'm working in one of those, so it becomes very problematic. Yeah. So what have you encountered in that regard? And what have you what do you think about it? Well trying to get to that. Um, I, I put this picture up because I think it's a good example of where this can be slightly overcome potentially. Um, the, 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 the real answer to your question is starting to have discussions and having discussions about ownership and access and images. But this is the Digital Monastery Project that's in Bhutan. And what they've been doing is they've been training monks to record the objects within their own temples. And the images that are taken are not necessarily ever shared with anybody else until something goes missing. So they have complete control over the images. They take the images, but if something goes wrong, they can share them. This doesn't work in every situation, obviously. In some situations that, again, I, I work in Nepal lately, uh, there are some items that you can't take a picture of the item, and that, that can be a point of interesting contention, and ultimately that, that becomes a decision that the, the, the community makes. But, but there are ways to try to overcome certain concerns that keeps the power of the images in the hands of the people who, who should have them. I mean, if, if you have a particular item that only one person can see, potentially that person can take the one photograph and keep it until something goes wrong. But dialogue <laughs> is the answer. But I, I think this is a good example of that, where, where they've kind of overcome a certain type of reluctance, which is understandable. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, I really enjoy your work because I do organ trafficking too. Oh, okay, yeah. There is certain similarities which is happening in the both contexts. So my take on that, that is it will be very difficult and always be pointed out that towards India or other places mm -hmm. where the law and order and corruption is pretty, you know, fragile in those contexts. So the demand is artificially created in that context. Right? Mm -hmm. So Kapoor went to India asked some people for $6,000 just stolen those goods. And that's and when it's stolen, yeah, yeah. And he knows the value of it, that he can capitalize on mm -hmm. that, right? So it's a demand created from the West. Mm -hmm. And so if that demand is, and there are some, you know, pretty thieves like who are stealing of course, things, yeah. pointing out towards them, and in a law and order towards India, and then that's the way. I think the, the, the my major focus we that we have to do that the, the, the you know the demand and how it's been created yeah. and it has to be radically transparent in the demand side that where the auction houses are and what they are dealing with and who are buying those objects and the compliances and those you know that has to be mostly focused on because that's the demand and, yeah. and the supply end like you know basically we're, we're not going to fix the developing world that the, the the core issues that allow antiquities trafficking to occur in places like India and places like Cambodia are what allow organ trafficking to occur there are other types of crime to occur there there are large systematic problems with corruption with development with um, effective policing and so on and so forth we're not going to fix that we can possibly intervene on the demand side. That's basically been some of our conclusions from aspects of our project. And that is the most difficult because that's the part that yeah. works in those contexts. Exactly. In way, it's very hard to expose that. Even though if you expose, that doesn't work because mm -hmm. the number of Western you know, uh, recipients mm -hmm. going overseas, having those organs, are six, you know, trafficking. Yeah. And well, where, where we have, at least for antiquities trafficking, the benefit over organ trafficking is is on this this non-criminalization that we talked about this this actually changing the culture of necessarily wanting to privately own these things um, if you need an organ and you're willing to traffic for an organ it's a bit different than antiquities where you can you can convince eventually convince folks that private collecting of antiquities is not great and maybe we shouldn't do that Organ trafficking a little bit different there, but the, but that's but that's again like you said this is this is where we can possibly intervene versus trying to deal with a much bigger, more complicated situation than 
<laughs> they can actually effectively have anything done, you know? That's very cool. <laughs> yep. Exactly. That's a good question, and I mean, we're thinking about models like um, what's been done for ivory and rhinoceros horn. Um, a certain type of demand for those objects has been really effectively curtailed, mostly in the West, and this is. This tends to be the demand for the art object version of these things. That's led to a different type of demand in other places that are that's harder to approach. But if you can make, when we're talking specifically about these kind of elite goods, if you can make them socially unacceptable in some way, that's very effective. If you have pictures of baby elephants crying over their dead mother, that really affects people. And it means that at so-and-so dinner party, if somebody has a big, huge ivory tusk, their friends start to judge them. So you make things socially unacceptable when you're talking about elite commodities like this. Um, it could shift in certain ways, but I, I think that that's actually the, the place for it, to, to keep connecting these with actual harms, to, to make it so when fancy somebody who can pay $5 million for an antiquity is having his dinner party, all his friends sit down and imagine Palmyra exploding around them when they see the objects, actually just connecting this activity with with the supply end of it, to, to make sure it's very clear that this is the end of a chain that leads to something quite ugly. So it's, it's a changing hearts and minds and, and kind of public awareness and just making it not, not cool anymore. <laughs> That's the only place I see hope in this because, you know, it's, sending these guys to jail, even if you ever could, is not necessarily going to end that. Um, and, but you make a very good point. The people at the lower level, again, the people who are actually doing this, the organized side of the, the, the trafficking, that those people are replaceable. Somebody will move in. And that's why we're identifying these Janus figures, because from the Janus figures onward, that is extremely specialized activity. Not anybody can just roll into those roles tomorrow, though you can get somebody else to loot the temples. <laughs> Certain types of people, yeah. <laughs> yep. I was going to say that um, in Mexico, one of the critical pieces um, was in 1977 when, as part of their redoing of regulations, they made it illegal for Mexicans mm -hmm. to hold antiquities. And while that may not have made a big difference on the village level, in the provincial cities it did, mm -hmm. and in Mexico City it did, the way you could avoid ending up in jail, and there was a handful of people who did, um, was to donate your collection. Uh, so there was this, this, in the late 70s and early 80s, there was this enormous number of state museums and being created, and they were all coming from provincial cities, from the lawyers and the doctors and mm -hmm. everybody else, who had paid people to go out and, and get this stuff, yeah. Um, that has continued under pressure from the Conservative Party of Mexico, which has been systematically trying to remove that part of the law. Mm -hmm. And Carlos Slim has worked, I think he's the wealthiest Mexican, um, very hard as long as the Conservative Party in Mexico was in power. Um, and then as they lost power, although they'll probably be back in soon, he suddenly builds a huge museum. And if you don't know the history of this, you don't realize he's built this museum because he's got an all of stuff, yeah. in a public place all of the illegal stuff that he has. Mm -hmm. um, and they're fighting over the colonial material. That's which is also covered by the law. It is, yeah. And that's, that's kind of the hot thing coming out of. Want it to be covered by the law. No. 
So it's, it's a constant issue, but as long as Mexicans couldn't hold collections, it made it much, much harder for goods to move out mm -hmm. internationally, except in Yucatan because the drug gangs moved yeah, they, in yeah. um, and used the Maya. Because you have that initial yeah. stage of legitimization of it. Yeah because he bought it from a Mexican collection, and even though it leaving Mexico is actually legal, it may appear legal in the place that it ends up. Yeah, every country has little which twists and turns like that. Matter. It's illegal every which way. Well, of course, yeah. Um, um, and they were using dynamite in the 90s. Yeah, as recently as that. Well, even, yeah. Every, every country has these interesting little twists and turns of their laws that can be exploited in a certain way, that can be com creatively complied to, um, that arguably by some has some sort of public benefit, doesn't necessarily engage in the context and history loss that's, you know, lost from all of this, um, and can be, and often rightly viewed as, well, it's better than nothing. But to continue these kind of amnesty programs, and, and usually these amnesty programs come into effect when the law has changed and, you, and it's announced that you can register your collections and you're fine if you did it before. But if there's never an end to the amnesty, then there's almost no point in having the regulation in the first place. Interesting stuff. There's plenty, there's, there's lots of really interesting cultural heritage law twists and turns for any, any budding lawyers and legal scholars in the room, because it, it gets crazy. Okay, well with that, I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you again, Donna. Yeah, thank you.